Hi, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to look at some of the imagery and symbolism in The Great Gatsby. Now, one of the first things that we're introduced to is this concept of East Egg versus West Egg. And for most of us, we're like, what does that matter? They're all rich. I mean, we're talking about the Hamptons out in Long Island. But this idea of East Egg versus West Egg is really old money versus new money. East Egg is where Tom and Daisy live. These are people who inherited their money. They didn't have to work for it. They have all these connections in history. They have very high social status and the sense of elegance and class. But at the same time, they seem kind of careless and shallow. They don't have to pay attention to money. They don't have to worry uh, to earn it. They don't really have to worry about what other people think of them. So they have this kind of careless attitude towards life. And contrast this with the new money in West Egg. These are people who have newly become rich, usually through some sort of work that they have done, or in Gatsby's case, possibly even through crime. These people very often do not have these kinds of family connections. They're trying to imitate the upper class, but sometimes not with the best results. They can come across as tacky or vulgar, throwing their money around, this idea of excess. But as Fitzgerald points out, there's this difference between the shallow, careless people of East Egg and then Gatsby, who is also loyal and appreciative and loving. So you have this contrast between East and West. And just for kind of a modern day example, you have Queen Elizabeth, whose family goes way back, you know, who's just simply inherited this because of who her daddy was. And then you have Kim Kardashian, who seems sort of, again, what is it that she does that she's famous for? But um, they've earned their money and they, if they kind of throw it around or seem tacky or vulgar or um, spending a lot of time in the media, that's that, more that sense of that new money. Now pay attention to the weather in The Great Gatsby because Fitzgerald is often giving you a lot of clues about what's going on. The weather very often matches Gatsby's mood or matches what's going on in the story. So for example, when Gatsby and Daisy are about to meet and Gatsby's all nervous, it's raining outside, but then when, they've, when Nick comes back in and the Gatsby and Daisy have gotten back together, the sun comes out again. Watch for the heat to rise as tensions and conflict rise in the book. Watch for gray and rain clouds when sad events are happening. The Valley of Ashes is this place of terrible pollution that, they, you, that the people in East and West Egg have to pass on the way into New York City. And this really represents, I mean, what is an ash? It's something that's been burned up. It's the leftover byproduct after everything else is spent. It's dry, it's gray. And this is really how George is described as being this sort of colorless, um, pale, ashy kind of guy. The used up, washed out. It's kind of the place where the dreams go to die and kind of represents the American dream in this case. And as Fitzgerald tells us, this is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens. Maybe the most famous symbol associated with Gatsby is the green light. Nick first sees him reaching out towards it. And we know it's just this light at the end of the dock, but if you think about the archetype of the color green, it means grow, it means go, it means growing, spring, renewal, life. And this really represents Gatsby's dream. It's, it literally is at the end of Daisy's dock is what he's going for is Daisy, but also the whole idea of the American dream and of getting these things that you've been working for. Now, in the Valley of Ashes near Tom Wilson's garage, or George Wilson's garage, is this old billboard. And the billboard itself is run down and falling apart. And it's some eye doctor from the past who put up this display called TJ, Dr. TJ Eckelberg. But it's this enormous pair of eyes. And it's definitely the sense of somebody looking down on you and judging you, kind of representing God in this case, looking down on all of these characters and seeing everything. Watch for more references in this, especially towards the end of the book. George Wilson is going to talk about it a lot and what is it that happens underneath the shadow of this billboard?
Now we've talked in class a lot about the different parties in the book. We have several party scenes and you really see them contrasted and broken down into three parts. You have Tom and Daisy's dinner parties and this is this old money traditional corrupt board kind of pointless. We see the party at Myrtle's apartment trying to imitate everything that Daisy would have but being sort of tacky and it turns violent and sort of sexual and drunkenness and this kind of immorality that happens. And then you have Gatsby's party, these over the top, Tom describes it as a circus, extravagant, almost kind of magic show, everything that's done to get Daisy's attention. And this is why Gatsby's been throwing these parties for all this time. Now, Daisy's daughter is only mentioned two or three times in the entire story, but pay attention when she does come in. First of all, she represents the fact that Tom and Daisy did have a real marriage. They've had a relationship. They have a child together. And Daisy says of her that when she was born and she found out that she had a girl, she said that she hopes that she's a beautiful little fool. In other words, that she's pretty enough, that she gets attention and things in life, but she's foolish enough to not realize that there should be more to life than just that. Now watch for colors throughout the whole book. We've already talked a little bit about the green light, but look at the colors white and yellow in particular. They tend to show up around Gatsby and around Daisy. A Daisy itself, obviously the flower, it, Daisy's almost always dressed in white, representing her girlhood, this innocence, this memory that Gatsby has of her. Look for the color yellow all around Gatsby. His car is yellow. He wears a gold tie with a silver shirt when he goes to meet Daisy. Now yellow is often an archetype meaning a coward. We say oh, you're yellow, you don't really, you know, you're not brave enough to do that. So think about how that might be applied, um, particularly, again, as we get towards the end of the book. But watch for this idea is yellow is also the color of gold, the color of money. Uh, silver and gold we talked about, and ashes, again, um, things that are pale, that are used up, that are um, not, not worth anything anymore. Speaking of Daisy, the plant names of the two women in the book are also kind of significant. Daisy obviously is a flower. It's associated again with white with a gold center. It's seen as kind of fragile. We pull the petals off of it one by one. It's something that shows up in the springtime. We often associate it with innocence. But at the same time, daisies in the wild actually kind of grow like weeds, and they're known for kind of choking and taking out the other plants. So kind of keep that in mind. And then we have myrtle. Myrtle is a small kind of shrub that kind of grows and covers the ground a little bit. It's kind of earthy and close to the ground. And it's very common. And again, you can kind of see where Fitzgerald is going with um, these names for his female characters. Fitzgerald makes several references to Daisy's voice, that she has this low, thrilling laugh, that she always sounds like you're the only person in the world that she wants to talk to, that she actually talks a little more quietly, so it's like you have to lean in a little bit more closely and listen to her. She's kind of seductive with her voice, and finally Gatsby kind of puts his finger on it when Nick is even trying to decide it. It says, she sounds like money. Uh, this older, um, you know, ancient... Uh, kind of inheritance, this class, this effortless richness that seems to accompany Daisy. The places in the novel themselves become very um, symbolic. We talked about East Egg and West Egg, but also New York City. Uh, New York City is kind of where anything goes. Most of the things associated with crime happen in New York City. We've got Gatsby's business being run out of there. Um, Tom, or Nick meets up with Meyer Wolfsheim and the, the mobsters there. And it seems to be a place of very limited morality. That's where Tom and Myrtle have their affair. That's where there's a big confrontation in the novel at the end. So New York seems to be kind of this wild, anything goes, the rules don't apply anymore place. And that's in direct contrast with the Midwest, which represents these sort of traditional family values in America, strong morality. And it's interesting to note, all of the characters in the novel are actually originally from the Midwest, but they all travel to and are living in the East, and that's where they all kind of become corrupt, even in Nick's case, only for a summer. And note at the end of the novel, Nick, and when Nick is telling us this story, he's telling it in this frame, that he has gone back to the Midwest and then talks about the events that happened that summer in New York.
Now, the last line of the novel talks about this idea of boats against the current. And we've seen boats several times. We know that Daisy and Gatsby's houses are separated by the bay. Um, but this idea of beating against the current, of trying to push back time, is really what Gatsby is doing throughout the entire novel, trying to recapture the past, this dream that he has that you can, and of course you can go back again, of course you can repeat the past. Um, and this idea of capturing the American dream by being able to go back and grab something that we all seem to have kind of lost in the 1920s, remember this lost generation idea. And that's the last line that Fitzgerald gives us in the story, is Nick reflecting on all of us being like boats beating against the current. And that's the end of the presentation on symbolism. Please feel free to go back and watch this if you need to, to remember what these symbols are as we continue reading the novel.